I thought I had to take action against them and that's, and that's what I did. He was first on my kind of um, list of things to take care of that morning. February 1997, in Rorimu, New Zealand, the Anderson family were up early to arrange a family breakfast with a group of friends that they had invited down for the long bake holiday weekend. As 18 of guests arrived for breakfast that morning, Neville Anderson greeted each and every one of them, showing them to the table. His wife Helen was keeping busy getting things ready for the breakfast when her son Stephen walked into the room. Stephen wasn't supposed to be there that weekend, but after a few difficult days at home, his mum brought him along to keep an eye on him. Standing at the door, he stared at everyone as they sat down for breakfast and he started muttering about having sex with a dog and then a cat. Helen, totally embarrassed by his behaviour, rushed over and told him to go and wash up and get ready for breakfast. Just as they were sitting down for breakfast, a few minutes later, Stephen came back into the room with a shotgun in his hand and a cartridge in his teeth. Neville, his father, got up and walked over to Stephen, asking him what he was playing at and to stop being silly and to put the gun down. As his father walked over, Stephen turned and pointed the gun straight at his chest. He shouted, you are the incarceration of the devil, and then bang! Hi, my name's Sarah Jade and welcome to my channel, where we talk about true crime, solved cases and more. Now let's get into this week's case. Neville and Helen Anderson were based in Wellington, in New Zealand, in a suburb called Kadalaya. Their son Stephen was born in 1973 and grew up with everything he needed. He had a loving and supportive family and grew up in a beautiful family home. In the mid-80s, his father purchased some land in the Roromu area, which is a tiny north island nestled in the rolling hills and is known as a great place for ski holidays or a place to escape, where he built a family home for them all to enjoy. Stephen would spend his weekends at the holiday home with his father, exploring the outdoors and trekking the New Zealand bush. They used to go on camping trips and when he got a little older, these turned into hunting trips. Being an outdoorsman became his life and his fascination with guns started at an early age. As soon as he reached the illegal age, he went to get his license and bought himself his first gun. This was a sawn off shotgun, which he kept in a violin case in his room. After high school, Stephen started to train as a dental technician. However, his mental health started to deteriorate. He became depressed and started to see the world as quite a scary place and he started to self-medicate on cannabis to hide the voices that he was hearing in his head. But unfortunately, this sent him further down the dark path, and he started to get in trouble with the police for disorderly behaviour. Then in 1995, things got even worse for Stephen, as he was admitted into hospital. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and was given medication to help him. He was soon released back into his family care, but the problem was that he wasn't taking his drugs, and started to self-medicate again on cannabis. This leads us up to the current weekend in 1997. Neville had been diagnosed with leukaemia just six months before and had to give up his job as a builder. So he was looking forward to just spending a long weekend with his family and relaxing up at the holiday home. Stephen had been struggling with his mental health over the last few days. His mum didn't think it was a good idea to leave him at home with the cats. So they decided to bring him along so they could keep an eye on him. For the first few days of the trip, Stephen would spend a lot of time in his room and would ramble about demons and how the forces were after him. Their friends became cautious and kept their distance from him. That morning, as they were sitting down for breakfast, Stephen, who was 22 at the time, walked into his bedroom, walked over to the cupboard, pulled out the violin case and pulled out his gun. Loading himself up with cartridges and placing one in his mouth, he walked back into the dining room where his parents' friends were sitting down for breakfast. As he entered the room, his father was shocked to see him with his gun. Thinking he was just playing around, he quickly jumped up and went over to Stephen and told him to put it down. While shouting at his son to put the gun down, Stephen lifted the gun, pointed it straight at his father and shot. His dad fell to the floor, dying instantly as he hit the ground and all hell broke loose. Everyone started to run from the table and out of the house while Stephen fired shots at them killing two more of their friends, Andrea Joy Vander and John Frederick Matthews. Andrea, 52, was a close friend of Helen's and lived next door to the Anderson with her husband Gordon. John was 28 years old 
and had been invited by one of his friends, and this was the first time he'd met the Andersons. While everyone started to flee the house, Stephen Hansen, whose girlfriend worked for the Andersons, was described as the ultimate nice guy, ran towards the phone. He picked up the handset and dialed 111. As the police answered the phone, they heard the muffled sounds of Stephen begging for his life, and then silence, as Stephen gunned him down as he left the house. Ray and E. Spencer were friends of the Andersons, and they originally declined to come on the trip, as Ray had been busy with work, but wanted the chance to relax, Ray had rang them up and agreed to come along. As they ran from the building that day, Eve was hit in the arm by one of the pellets from the second shot, but they felt relief that they had escaped relatively unharmed. As they began to relax, Ray turned round and saw Stephen staring back at them. They went to die behind a bush when another shot rang out. Ray's glasses flew from his face and he knew he'd been shot. In that split second, he knew the only way he could stop him shooting was to pretend he was dead. So he flung his arms open and fell to the floor like he'd been shot in the back. His wife Eve gasped as she saw him fall to the floor when he whispered to his wife to remain still and silent. Another shot rang out going straight through the bush before Stephen walked away. As Stephen walked down the drive he saw Isabel and Anthony who had run out of the house. Isabel and Anthony had lived near the Andersons and were described as a friendly couple enjoying their retirement and loved spending time in their garden. As they ran from the lodge down the path, they had just reached the trees when Isabel felt a shock, hit her back and she blanked out. She awoke a while later and noticed that her husband was lying dead beside her. He'd been shot in the side of the head and died from his injuries. Isabel knew she had to get to safety, so she started to drag herself down the driveway before she passed out again. She was later woken by police. Michelle Churton, not knowing that her boyfriend had been killed in the house, hid behind the undergrowth and stayed there for two hours. She described her as she heard many shots and lots of screaming. The police had to persuade her to come out as she was convinced that Stephen was still in the area. Stephen continued to walk down the street. During the shooting, his mum had run out of the house and jumped over the fence to their neighbour's house called Hank. Hendrik, known as Hank, lived next door with his wife Helena. He was born in the Netherlands and had moved to New Zealand for a better lifestyle. That weekend, his son, daughter-in-law and their grandchildren had come over to visit. He was outside in his garden, packing up his car, when Helen jumped over the fence, asking for his help. Hank, his son Rodney and his daughter-in-law, Kim, ran over to help. Hank turned round and told Rodney to go back to the house, call the police and get the children out of the area. His son ran back to the house, grabbed the children and put them in the car with his mum. As he was backing up the drive, Stephen appeared by their car. Rod jumped out of the car and told Stephen to back off and leave him alone, as he was shot. He wanted to get him away from the children, so he tried to convince Stephen to follow him. However, he collapsed in the bush from his injuries. Hank ran out in the road to pull over a large truck to help them. The lorry driver was trying to get his radio to work, but had to move to get a better signal. And as he looked back out of his window, he saw Stephen hanging over Hank and shot him dead. Stephen then pointed the gun at his daughter-in-law, Kim. He stopped, hesitated, changed his mind and disappeared into the roadside bush. Thankfully, the shot that Stephen had fired through the bush had missed Eve by 30 centimetres and left a hole in the wood just above where her head was. They had stayed in the bush until they had seen Stephen was out of sight. They then ran down the road and flagged down a car and urged him to call the police and let them get into their car. He drove them down to the local school where they could get help and warn the local community. The police quickly made their way to the area to track down Stephen using helicopters and planes to scan the terrain. After an hour of searching, one of the officers spotted a naked man running from the bush. After catching up with him, he surrendered and lay down on the floor. He was handcuffed, put in the helicopter and broke down sobbing and crying hysterically. In the attack, Stephen had killed six people. His dad Neville, Andrea Brander, Stephen Hansen, John Matthews, Anthony McCarthy and Hank Van de Wettering, and injured four. Isabel McCarthy, Eve Spencer, Ray Spencer and Rodney Wettering. Once in custody, Stephen confessed everything. He said he thought his father was a dog and it was all down to God. He didn't feel like he had a choice in the matter and had to kill them to save the world. A memorial service was held for the victims on the 8th of February 1998 and Stephen was tried in court in Hamilton. 
After eight days, Stephen was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was detained indefinitely at a mental health institute in Puara Hospital. It is said that he found inner peace through daily meditation and study in Buddhist training. He said he healed quite quickly, but had to find some way of dealing with what he'd done. Are you genuinely remorseful for what happened that oh, day? Oh, most definitely. Um, I have, I maintain a sense of regret uh, for what's happened. I, I have, I have regrets. Um, of course I'm sorry for what happened. Uh, it was a, a terrible mistake, but um, it's been recognised for a long time that um, in, in that altered state, uh, when we're not that person, we're not um, we're not the person who you see before you now, uh, you know. So he started to meditate and write poems, where he wrote a collection of thirty-five poems called "The Toys in the Attic." In two thousand and nine, Stephen was then released. He was released under strict guidance into the care of his mum, who had stood by him throughout the whole incident. Area, I think it was prison where he was taken and I said I don't know that I can go and see him you know because I had such mixed feelings about what had happened but I knew he'd be feeling very alone he'd be very um, um, mixed up in his you know feelings and um, and who better to go and see him than his mum and immediately I saw him I just hugged him and just wanted to know that he was all right. He was living in a flat in Colston Park and wrote an article in the North and South magazine speaking of the events and apologising for his actions. He was called back to the hospital just two years later after it was alleged it was taken the cannabis substitute, Chronic, but then was released back in 2014. This is where he went to work as an art tutor before they learned about his crime and he was let go. The family of the victims feel like they've been let down and live in fear every day of him returning. Some have said they've never gone to the event if they had known Stephen was going to be there, and Helen had even apologised to them when they had turned up for the event. Isabel said there's been no apology, no remorse, and they've heard absolutely nothing from Stephen whatsoever. However, they blame his mum, but who really was to blame? After the investigation, his father Neville was actually blamed for the incident, due to his casual and careless attitude towards storing guns. Two years before the shooting, Stephen was arrested for hooliganism and his gun licence was revoked by the police. The police have been concerned about Stephen having access to guns and his deteriorating mental health, and they tried to revoke Neville's licence as well. However, Neville heavily objected to this and responded to the police saying that Stephen would have no access to his guns and he would store everything away, when in fact this was not the case and had even allowed Stephen to keep his shotgun, which was the gun they had used in the shooting. The inquest determined that the shooting would have never happened if the guns weren't in the house. To me, to basically save the world, and it sounds crazy, and it is. I didn't feel I had a choice in the matter, and that, I mean, if you think the world's going to end unless I do this, um, even though I loved my father, my father loved me, I saw him as the, the leader of this group of people and um, he was first on my kind of um, list of things to take care of that morning. There are also a lot of people that blame his mum. She had actually found him a couple of days earlier cleaning his gun in his bedroom. He told her that they were coming for him and she told him to stop being silly as no one was coming but she failed to take his gun away. Her friends also say that she shouldn't have held the event knowing how ill her son was, and they definitely would have come to the event knowing the extent of his mental health. Stephen only came with us because we were concerned he might harm himself at home being on his own, okay? Because he was not very well at that time. And, um, and you know, sometimes thinking, well, if we hadn't, invited him up or insisted he came with us actually on that occasion how different things might have been you know however a lot of people believe that she's not to blame as she was overwhelmed by his behavior and could not recognize how ill he actually was and she wasn't given the help and correct support by the health services the wellington health board were also blamed for their subpar treatment of stephen 
and the lack of support that was given to the family. There are many people that suffer from mental health problems and go on to live normal lives, but there are some that need that extra support and care to live a normal life. What do you think? Do you think it's right that he's out now? Who do you think is to blame? Let me know your thoughts and comments below. Thank you for watching and if you like this video, be sure to subscribe and check out last week's video following the story of Sherry Papini and how she was kidnapped on her evening run. But all is not as it seems. Thank you for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one. You call me a saint but you know I'm a stranger, a willing and able.